you should make that core. So it has the, the matrix, the capsid, the nucleocapsid. These are, these are the parts of the virus that, that protect the DNA or the RNA and package the RNA. The next big gene family it has is the Paul gene, which encodes a protease that the virus needs to process its proteins. And it also has the reverse transcriptase, which is the very, very unique enzyme that retroviruses have that allows them to turn RNA into DNA. That is a path that our cells don't normally use. That Paul gene also encodes another viral protein called the integrase, which is how the virus can take the DNA it makes and move it into other pieces of DNA, which we'll talk about as we go through the life cycle. The final main uh, gene encodes the envelope, which again are these proteins that the virus needs to, to match with host cells and to get into host cells. These are really small genomes. They're only 7,000 to, to 10,000 kilobases. Um, and what's unique about retroviruses is each end has this, this repeated region. And that's a really important region for how the virus spreads its genes, how it gets into DNA. And virologists spend a lot of time studying the, the regulatory elements of that, but we're not going to go into details about that today. So we, we hadn't known about retroviruses for really all that long. So the, the first uh, retrovirus that was identified was identified as a cancer-causing agent in 1908, and that's avian leukemia virus, which was isolated to chickens. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how they figured out what this virus was in a couple slides. Shortly after, um, a second retrovirus was isolated from chickens. This is route sarcoma virus. And that, this is an interesting virus because it's the first oncogenic retrovirus that's been described. Now, oncogenic means it's a retrovirus that causes cancer. Following those initial discoveries, there's been uh, many retroviruses discovered in all, all sorts of different animal models, including mice, cats, monkeys, cows. And our history as humans with retroviruses as far as we know, well, they've been in our history for a really long time, but we didn't know about them until 1980. In 1980, the first human retrovirus was isolated, and this was done at the Gallo lab um, in NIH. This was from a patient with T-cell leukemia, and that's what they ended up naming virus, T-cell leukemia virus, um, human T-cell leukemia virus. And a couple years later, studying more leukemia patients, they found a closely related uh, additional T-cell leukemia virus, HTLV2, and this is all happening in the early 80s, around a time when AIDS started to manifest in the population, and this kind of culmination of events led us to, to discover HIV. So far, in addition to those, there's been a total of six human retroviruses. All of the human retroviruses infect T cells. There's two different broad groups of retroviruses, simple and complex. Simple is what we talked about before, where they're really encoding these GAD, POL, and N genes, the bits that you need, the minimal components you need to make a virus. But there are slightly more complex retroviruses, complex retroviruses. They encode those same things that you need to make a virus, but they also have a bunch of little genes here and there. And these little genes, what they do is they're, they're the type of things that help us, help the virus hide from our immune system. Um, so, so these genes um, also help in the replication of the virus. So they're just sort of a more evolved version of a retrovirus. And these accessory proteins allow the virus to just be better at hiding, better at evading your immune system, and better controlling their own replication. These simple retroviruses are really more, are, are not really independent. They're really more linked to the cell. Whereas complex retroviruses, some of these other genes they express give them a little more control about how and when they are expressed. Now, the way this works, they have really small RNA genomes. So they're trying to pack a lot of things into a small amount of space. And you can see that when, when we sort of annotate what their genes look like, we kind of put them in these overlapping bits, and there's lots of stuff overlapping, right? It's not a list of one gene goes from here to here, and the next one starts. And that's because what they're doing is they're doing a complicated uh, structure to save space. It means when the virus starts expressing its genes, it can express the full transcript. That'll be a copy of the RNA that the virus needs to propagate and pass on to its progeny. But if you have to express individual genes, that's happened by splicing. And splicing is a natural process our host cell does when it's editing RNA messages to get genes. The virus takes advantage of that, and it makes its own splices so that it can express just part of the gene. And in the complex retrovirus, this gets really complicated. It's got to do a lot of different splicing, sometimes dual splicing. But this is, it has these 
um, sequences encoded that allow it to, to use our splicing system to cut out and express just the genes it needs during different stages of the replication cycle. The other thing it does um, is it uses frame shifts. So it has two different read star sites so that different genes can be expressed from the same transcript. All of this is just the way that viruses have evolved to pack more stuff into a smaller bit of RNA. And actually one of the reasons why we generally think like viruses like small genomes is it's less to copy. That means you can do it really efficiently. You can make a lot of copies in a small amount of time. So yes, you can make it bigger, but bigger is sort of a bigger target for the host to find it, and it's a little bit more difficult to copy. So this is actually a more efficient system. All right, so what does a retrovirus do? Retroviruses have a pretty complicated life cycle. So just like all viruses, it has to start with binding. The virus has to find your cell. And it has to match to a particular receptor on the cell that the virus envelope protein is, um, is a binding partner for. That binding interaction allows the membrane, so it has, the virus has that same kind of lipid membrane our cells have. So those two membranes, like things, match with like things, they fuse, and that allows the virus to, to stick to the surface and empty its internal contents into the cell. And the internal contents contents are that protein capsid that has all the viral proteins that it needs and has all the copies of the RNA that it needs. Once it gets in the cell, that capsid uncoats and the viral RNA is released. This is where the two next steps are what is absolutely unique to, to these retroviruses. That RNA is then copied into DNA. So a single-stranded RNA becomes a double-stranded DNA, and that's done with the help of the retrovirus um, reverse transcriptase. So this then migrates to the nucleus, and then another viral enzyme, the integrase, inserts this newly formed double-stranded viral DNA into the host cell genome. This is another really unique concept when you think about it. Viruses, we think about they infect our cells, they make a lot of copies of themselves, they may destroy your cell or not, but all of that is dependent of what's going on in our genes, our chromosomes. Retroviruses don't do that. They actually go into our DNA and they're expressed from our DNA. So this is, this is a very unique thing, and this is one of the problematic things about retroviruses, as we'll talk about um, as we go along. Okay, so once it's in our DNA, the viral genes can be transcribed, meaning copied and translated, meaning turned into proteins, um, and we get more copies then of the viral single-strand RNA genome. So our bodies are really good at turning DNA to RNA, right? We do that direction quite well, so we make copies of the viral DNA. This all then gets packaged um, into the viral protein, into the viral capsid, and that viral capsid accumulates on the envelope of the cell, and as it buds and releases from the cell, it grabs a bit of our cell's membrane on the way out, and that's what, that's what coats it. Yes? Well, uh, you just learned a lot about how uh, virus chains so is it because it's like kind of taking some of the membranes that it that makes the host cell all like its other functionality or like why does I mean yeah it is kind of trans like doing the transcription from trust with like trying to wire DNA to RNA but it's still doing that same process for the rest. Yeah, yeah. So, so not just retroviruses, but one of the things that they think that's kind of unique about viruses in general is they're promoters. So the bits of their genetic material that recruit things that recruit our host proteins to translate and express their genes are stronger than the promoters. Generally, are stronger than the promoters we have on our genes. Right? We're trying to sort of control ourselves, sort of trying to control levels of what it expresses. So promoters, and we have all these feedback things that are tuned to only make a certain number of copies of things. But a virus comes in and says, nope, I want you to just blast my gene. And it just has a really strong promoter. So it, by default, is, is sort of you know, not fully stopping what the cell does, but you get a lot more of the viral gene expressed than you do cell genes. And that's a common thing um, across really all virus families, a lot of virus families. And we take advantage of that in laboratory systems because if we want to, um, you know, make a, say, uh, a, a protein in the lab, right, we're going to do that by putting it on a 
plasmid and then putting it in a cell and saying, okay, make lots of protein. We don't use protein, we don't use promoters from people, we use promoters from viruses because it'll help us make it fun of that protein, right? So um, we kind of leverage that for our benefit. But when a virus is infected, it's definitely not for your benefit because your cell is preferentially if you can work that. So, um, so this whole path, this, this step into the, into the DNA is really what makes them unique, and it also is really what makes them pathogenic. And one of the ways that, that retroviruses are pathogenic is that several of them contain oncogenes. An oncogene, when you hear that term, that really just means it's a gene that controls how your cells grow. So if that gene gets messed up, you could develop cancer, right? Um, so in, in retroviruses, the way, they, the way they became oncogenic is because when they spent some time in our DNA, and then came back out with the virus, sometimes that sort of copying and extraction system, it doesn't just get the virus, it might get some of the DNA that's next to where the virus went in. This is an error that happens, if you have to remember, millions and millions and millions and millions of cells are infected over like thousands and thousands and thousands of years in the evolution of a virus in people, right? So it's, it's realistic that occasionally some of our DNA comes out and ends up packaging the virus, right? And that's, and that's sort of what has happened. And um, in this example, this first oncogenic virus that's spread throughout the coma virus, some point in evolutionary history, the gag, call, and end gene of the retrovirus went into the DNA of a chicken. And when it was made copied, some of the DNA next to it in the genome of the chicken was copied. And it happened to be that part of what was copied is one of these genes that control cell growth. And that came along for the ride, ended up in, in the virus, right? And now that is sort of a new virus. And when that goes into chickens, it actually probably has a selective advantage because it helps the cells to grow really well. So growing proliferating cells can make more virus. And the way they, they figured this out you know, 100 years ago, how do you do virology 100 years ago? They started taking these sarcomas, so these proliferations from chickens, they just mash them up, and then you put them through a filter. And back in the day, they used different material filters that had different sort of known pore sizes. And what they used here was, you know, I don't know if it was a porcelain or ceramic, there was different grades of filter. One of the smallest filters they have, collect what came through, put that back in another chicken, and that chicken would develop cancer. So they knew it was something that could be transferred, they knew it was smaller than bacteria. At that time, we knew viruses existed, so that was sort of the, the key experiment that said this is a viral transfer cancer, right? So none of the retroviruses that infect people have these oncogenes. None of them have done exactly this. But that doesn't mean they can't cause cancer. And in fact, they do. But they do it by a different, different approach. Um, and that's called insertional mutagenesis. OK, so how does this work? As I told you before, the retroviruses have these really strong promoters. OK? And that means when they go into our DNA, Yes, they're making lots of copies of themselves, but they also are probably impacting the expression of genes right around. So in our, in our you know, sort of simple modified system, our cell cycle is controlled by two opposing systems. We have genes in our body that tell our cells to proliferate because our cells do need to proliferate and grow. That's a good thing. But that has to be regulated so that it doesn't go too crazy. That's what cancer is. And one of the ways that's regulated is, one, this, this pro-growth gene has a promoter on it that our body has evolved to say this is the right amount of growth, right? The other way it's, it's uh, maintained is there's genes that antagonize that, that can suppress it. So sort of the system of checks and balances in a healthy individual that control how much your cell grows, how many copies it makes, so you don't develop cancer. If you have a retrovirus, one of two things can happen. One, where it inserts can increase the expression of these proto-oncogenes. So because they have strong promoters, they might go and tell genes around it that are promoting cell growth over, be overstimulated, right? And that can cause, that can cause pro-replication. So abnormal cell cycle cancer. That's probably the way that, that in most cancers it, it happens. Um, the other thing that could happen is when a retrovirus goes into DNA, it's not necessarily going between genes, right? Or in like just free space. Sometimes it could go in a gene and script function 
or in the, the regulatory region of a gene and script its function. So in that case, it could, in some cases, it messes with one of these genes that job is to suppress cell growth um, so that even if you don't have, you know, a really strong on signal, there's no off signal, right? And then you still develop cancer. So that's what happens in the, in the case of the, of the um, retroviruses that cause human cancer. They're not really carrying a gene, but they're, they're integrating in positions in our DNA that are messing up genes we already have. We get too much cell growth, therefore developing cancer. All right, so human retroviruses, again, the first one was, was this T-cell leukemia virus. Um, this is actually, you know, now that we know about it, it's, it's a kind of worldwide distribution, but um, for reasons that I'm not entirely aware of, it's hyper-endemic in, in Japan, the Caribbean, and West Africa. And in those areas, you can have 30% of the adults infected. Um, like all retroviruses, this is transmitted through things like blood transfusion, sexual intercourse, breastfeeding, um, you know, needle sticks, anything like that would, would transmit it as well. Overall, most people that have it don't develop disease, right? It sort of depends on, on where it integrates in your DNA and whether or not it's near one of those tumor, that, that growth regulating area. And some individuals will then, you know, depending on how it integrates, develop sort of these proliferative disorders. Now, knowing about that, that sort of was the background of, of how we came to understand a little bit about HIV-1 and 2. And, and the origins of HIV-1 and 2, hopefully you all got to see, maybe some of you got to see Dr. Fauci's talk here at Duke, which really, um, you know, uh, he was there, you know, splitting it and uh, can, can give a great history of HIV-1 and 2. Um, and, and this is sort of the cliff note short version, but, you know, in, in the early 80s, um, the way this arose was just clusters of previously healthy gay men in New York and L.A. started to, to be found suffering from these severe, you know, immunodeficiency disease. These are the kind of disorders that, that are, up until then, were really associated with really elderly people in poor health or cancer patients on a lot of immune suppression, not people who were otherwise healthy. Um, and that, you know, a couple of those clusters, and they started naming the disease, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Um, and that's when it was figured out that this is a transmittable disease because it started, there was cases of it being transmitted by blood transfusion and blood, and blood products. Um, so another year later, you know, the virus was isolated um, and described, and Dr. Fauci talked about that. And, and then a few years later, we found another related virus that we don't talk about all that much called HIV-2, um, uh, which is more... Um, restricted to, to West Africa. Um, so when we think about HIV, we're often bad about properly naming it in the things we do. HIV, we're almost always talking about HIV-1 um, because that's the cause of the AIDS pandemic. HIV-2 exists. It's a lower virulence. It doesn't make people as sick. And it's really stayed endemic to just one region in, in West Africa. This is not something that has spread through the world. So, so we're really not actively doing much research on hiv so where did, where did it all come from? Well, I think we all know by now that, that it's very closely related to, to viruses that infect African monkeys. And through a whole bunch of phylogenetic tracking and you know, gene evolution studies, um, it's, it's been traced back to a common virus, um, simian immunodeficiency virus, which is very closely related to HIV. And we think that the HIV global pandemic originated from a virus that was endemic in monkeys. So this is one of those zoonotic transmission events, much like we had with COVID, right? This was a virus that actually isn't super pathogenic in monkeys, um, but obviously it's spread and can cause a global pandemic. HIV-2 is, is another SIV, and this, um, uh, in fact, a lesser mon monkey, the Pseudomagabe. Um, and again, this one has really stayed in, in West Africa. It isn't really a major problem. Uh, there's some really great stories about, you know, the early work of virus hunters, you know, developing this, um, uh, finding this um, connection to SIV and um, podcast. I think it was... Um, there's a Patient Zero podcast from Radiolab where we talk about Beatrice Hahn, who's a, a famous HIV investigator um, at UPenn, and you know her work in the early days was standing under, underneath monkey, you know, sleeping nests and uh, chimpanzee nests in, in Africa at night, and just holding a cup out and waiting for them to drop their droppings. You know, <laughs> that she can tap it, take it to the lab, and do the viral. Uh, pretty interesting study. Um, so yeah, transmission. Of course, the most common route is. Worldwide, is sexual transmission. Um, the risk is higher if partners have other sexually transmitted diseases, or if the, the sex act occurs during primary HIV infection. So the two reasons there is if you have another sexually transmitted disease, you probably have a 
sort of a more inflamed um, environment, uh, and those activated inflamed sites actually promote virus replication. And um, if the other aspect of this, the primary HIV infection, uh, during, as we'll see, during primary infection, people really have a lot of virus in their blood. So there's a higher risk of transmission. Vertical transmission uh, used to be called mother to child transmission. Um, and that's, that's exactly what it sounds like. This is babies being born to mothers living with HIV do have a risk of acquiring HIV from their moms. And um, if you're, if the mom is during, uh, isn't being treated for HIV, then the risk is relatively high, 10 to 40%. Um, and this can happen uh, in utero, so before the baby's born, sort of around the time of birth, which is the most common, or even through breastfeeding after birth. And the other uh, sort of lesser, um, uh, less important or, or less common modes of, of transmission are, are through intravenous drug use, needle sticks, um, or a really low risk of what we call mucocutaneous exposure, which is through a cut or scratch. All right, so I think it's pretty well known, but it's always helpful to see the numbers again and think about them because they're, they're quite staggering. I mean, HIV is, is a major uh, global health challenge. Uh, it's been estimated that it claims um, more than 36 million lives. Um, I need to update my stats, but in 2020, there was an estimated 1.5 million people who acquired HIV. So every year, we're still getting well over a million new infections. And in 2020, it was estimated that 680,000 people died of HIV. So a million plus new infections and over 600,000 people dying every year. The problem, the reason we have all this is there's no cure and there's no vaccine. Okay. But we do have treatment. So effective antiretroviral therapy um, does help control the virus and, and, you know, can help people live a long life. Um, but I think, you know, the, another really important thing about that is those drugs, people need to take them and they need to take them for life. And one of the problems we still have in the HIV uh, epidemic um, is we're still infecting. You know, we have a, over 1.7 million children infected and the estimates are like somewhere around 150,000 kids or babies are getting infected with HIV every year. They're going to need 80 years of medicine, right? I mean, it's constant treatment for their entire life. So I think that's one of the, the you know, the urgent areas of need that, that we need to, um, you know, intervene there as best we can. 34 million, 35 million is a huge number in the world of big places, but this is a local problem too. Um, so the CDC has looked at all, of, all the stats, and, and basically the idea here is that where we are in the South is actually the area that has the highest burden of HIV in the United States. So, so these states account for 52% of, of new diagnoses in HIV. So North Carolina, unfortunately, we're one of them. If you get even more hyperlocal than that and think about certain populations, this is a really interesting statistic from the CDC, where they're looking at lifetime risk of HIV diagnosis among men who have sex with men by race and ethnicity. So African-American men who have sex with men, their lifetime risk based on the CDC estimate is one of two. Right? So granted, this is maybe getting to be a slightly rare population, but you know, lifetime risk of one to two, this is staggering. Right? This, is, this remains a major, major problem. One of the reasons why it's such a major problem is because it's an incredibly diverse virus, right? We, we think, uh, we know a lot more about, we understand the ramifications of viral diversity now as a population, as a world, thanks to COVID, when everyone got their COVID vaccine and then still got sick because the virus changed and the new vaccine, right? We, we, we are all educated on diversity. Well, HIV has been giving people who study HIV vaccines and, and treatment this problem for, for, you know, 40 years, right? Um, it's globally diverse. The, the virus that we have circulating here in the United States looks very different from most of the virus that's circulating in regions of Africa. Looks very different from the Asian variants, right? They've, they've, they've kind of grown their own uh, version in different areas. So there's all these different, what we call clades, um, and we characterize them, and there's certain uh, phylogenetic relationships we can do to decide to determine what clade a virus is in. But importantly, they, they differ a lot. Easily like 30% of their envelope, a gene that we would want to target if we're going to make a, an antibody or a vaccine are different. And then on top of that, there's what we call recombinant forms, but there's mixing between them. This all happens because 
this process of, of making an RNA, DNA to RNA is a little bit slow. In particular, that RNA to DNA step. So the virus has this enzyme reverse transcriptase that turns, uh, you know, their RNA to DNA. Well, their enzyme, the virus enzyme, is pretty simple. It's small. It makes copies, but it doesn't do it very carefully, and it doesn't have what our replication systems have, which is error, error proofing, right, proofreading activity. So it's going to make mistakes, um, and it's been estimated that it makes like mistakes every, you know, one out of every hundred thousand copies or something like that. The genome is about ten thousand, you know, bases, but but then it's making like 10 to the 10 variants per day, uh, you know, staggering amount of diversity. So I think they estimate like, you know, you're getting like millions of variants every day just based on the mutation. The other way that you get diversity is, I said before, the virus has two copies of single strand RNA, which is really weird for viruses. Why does it have two copies of the same thing? I don't know why it does, but one of the problems is, is when people are exposed to two different HIVs, if they get the same cell, we don't always pack up the two copies that came with one box with virus A, with virus A, you might get an A, B, and A, B. So that's where these recombinant norms have come up, where people who have been infected with two very different HIVs package one copy each, and then when that goes into the DNA and it reads through, sometimes you get a new virus that has visible, and that's, that's called recombination. And that just further complicates the whole system. This diversity is exactly why most of our vaccines have failed. So these are the press releases from the, most last, the two most recent efficacy studies where we're trying to make a vaccine, test it in a population, and say, did it reduce the risk of infection? But lately, the answer has been no. So, and currently, there's actually no efficacy studies going on. So there's a lot of HIV vaccines in development, but there are none being tested for protection right now, which is sort of sad. That means we're a good 10 years away, at best, from having an HIV vaccine. Yes. So when, when these vaccines are designed, are they designed for, for certain regions and tested in them? Yeah, so interestingly, sometimes yes, sometimes no. And this vaccine, this mosaic, which has the title of the vaccine study, like gives you an idea, they were really trying to accomplish first. In a bunch of computational approaches to figure out, you know, based on the position of different envelope variants, what would be an imaging that would represent the diversity of all of HIV. Everyone had really high hopes for it. It worked really well in monkeys. And it uh, failed, you know, dramatically in, in the human studies. So uh, both approaches are, are ongoing. You know, some people thinking that we need regional vaccines, some people think we need broad vaccines. So far, um, none of them have really stuck. So, um, so HIV specifically, we can look at this and quite simply, quite readily know that this is the more complicated of the retroviruses. This is what we call a complex retrovirus. Has a lot of these little genes that help it uh, work, invade our immune system and control its expression to some degree. The replication, uh, entry replication of HIV, exactly as I showed you for the other retroviruses, it has to do all the same steps. That's what makes it a retrovirus. Important to HIV is the receptor it uses, which here is CD4. So that's the primary receptor that the virus uses to recognize its target cell. And it also uses the co-receptor. Uh, it needs both of these. So the co-receptor is another um, host protein, CCR5 or CSCR4. It needs to interact with both of these to form this stable binding interaction that allows the virus to use and then release its RNA, go through the process of uh, reverse transcription integration, but all of that. Okay. What happens in the course of HIV infection is like most virus infections, shortly after an initial infection, this red line is viral load, virus makes a lot of copies, right? That's what happens in almost every virus infection we get, which is why, you know, after you've had a virus for few days or a couple weeks to feel sick, right? And, and even in HIV, this, this sort of upregulate, this, this dramatic rise in virus means your immune system is going to kind of do the same thing and try to fight it, and that's when you start feeling flu-like symptoms, you'll have fever, sickness, all of that. So that's, those flu-like symptoms are part, of, are part of HIV. What happens is that's our immune system ramping up. Our immune system sort of starts to do its thing and will control the virus to some degree. But unfortunately, it never gets away. It can hide in our DNA, and it can just kind of hang out there and periodically, to some level, reactivate. And that's going to be this progression of viral load that happens over years, decades. While it's doing that, it's using our CD4 cells, right? That's what it's targeting. So those start to decline, right? And they'll decline over time. We'll get to a certain point where you have very low CD4 cells, so you further lose your immune control, and that's where things really go downhill. You have 
sort of this dysfunctional immunity because you lost C4 cells, the virus is now ramping up, and that's where you start seeing these, these symptoms of AIDS, right? This is where you're immune deficient, and these opportunistic diseases can start taking over, right? So people with uh, HIV aren't dying from loss of, from, from the virus directly, they're dying from um, bacterial infections, cancers, you know, opportunistic uh, fungal infections, opportunistic infections that our immune system would otherwise be able to control. That CD4 decline that is characteristic of the development of AIDS um, occurs in a couple of different ways. One, well, the virus is going into our cells, making lots of copies of itself, and then budding and sort of blowing up, and, and that is uh, what we call a lytic virus infection that eventually will kill the cell that was producing the virus. So that's one way you lose CD4 cells. Another way you lose them is that that whole process generates a lot of immune activation and inflammation. Inflammation can cause cells to just spontaneously decide that they need to die because it's an unhealthy environment, and that's called apoptosis. And that's probably the, the number one thing that gets rid of most CD4 cells in HIV infection. The other thing that contributes to the CD4 decline is our immune system, right? So our immune system is out looking for infected cells. When it finds an infected cell, it is going to eliminate it before it has a chance to make new viruses. So all three of these things contribute to, over time, loss of CD4 cells, and then therefore loss of immune function. We have a good weapon, right? So we don't have vaccines, but we do have antiretroviral therapy. Antiretroviral therapies, um, what they do, if this is a normal disease progression, right, where uh, you start to have CD4 decline, your viral load is going up, if we can use an antiretroviral therapy, we can prevent that virus from replicating, that will drive this viral load down. All those CD4 cells are now sort of safe and happy. They can recover, and we have sort of this, this preservation of immune function and um, the ability to not succumb to, to this immune deficiency. This is sort of the history right here of the development of medicines. As Dr. Fauci was telling us in the you know, very beginning, these patients, there was no ART, so there was really nothing to give them. And then AZT came along in the mid-80s, 87. Yeah, 87. Um, and that was the first weapon that, that could actually be used to prevent viral replication. And then since then, a lot of new uh, um, drugs have been developed, so we actually have a pretty good catalog of antiretroviral therapies now. As Dr. Fauci told you, you know, these show, these have made a profound impact on HIV treatment. So this is, on the left is, is thinking about on the individual level what this has done. So um, in the early days, that first decade, 81 to 92, when we had <coughs> first no drugs and then sort of limited drug with limited availability in the mid-80s, individuals who were infected with HIV, this is a, a, a survival curve uh, years after Diagnosis. You can see if you kind of project out to like a five year survival point, 75% of people would not last five years um, if they were diagnosed with AIDS. More drugs came on, right? The more drugs we have, the better we can use them, the less the virus can sort of escape from them. So in the next decade, that got better. Now we're a little over 50%, right? And now in the more modern times, um, this, this chart is the only one that was up in 2003, but, but the reality of it is. Five years survival rate now is probably very close to 100% if people are actively using the drugs properly because we can really control the viral infection. Globally, this has made a huge impact too. So this is this line right here is the sort of global trends of um, the number of age-related deaths globally. You can see that over time, this was getting worse, right? The pandemic is spreading, population keeps growing, more people are dying, right? And then drugs started getting used more. So these, these bar charts are, are the um, sort of the, the amount of people that are uh, that are receiving the antiretroviral therapy. You can see once we started getting more people on ART, now we've kind of inverted that curve, and you're making a global benefit and reducing the number of deaths, right? And you sort of get this inflection point now where this is really going down as the number of people living with HIV drugs going up. So. Um, as I said before, we have 650,000 or so people dying every year of HIV. Um, we probably would have almost none if we could get everyone on antiretroviral therapy and make them take it really well, um, because this, is, this has a tremendous impact. Now, the nice thing about a uh, virus with a complicated life cycle like HIV, it actually means there's a lot of things we could target when we're thinking of how to make drugs or, or develop drugs for it. 
Um, so the, the main class of the drugs that we have now target all different points of the virus life cycle. So we have inhibitors that prevent this interaction between CE4 and CCR5. We call them, uh, you know, attachment or binding inhibitors. Um, there's drugs that can that can prevent fusion. Uh, there's a drug uh, developed here at Duke. Um, I think the commercial name is Fusion, and the lab is called C20, but that's a drug that prevents the, the fusion of the membrane. A lot of drugs target this viral reverse transcriptase, reverse transcriptase enzyme. That's because it's, it's an enzyme that has to do a lot of work. It's critical to copying the virus, and it's a bit sloppy, so we could sort of trick it a little bit easily. Um, so that's really the, the, the kind of gold standard treatment. This integration event where the DNA has to integrate into RDNA, that is a very unique biological process that is a viral enzyme, so that's another enzyme that, that drugs target. And the last one is the virus buds from our surface. It's not quite infectious yet. It's got to do a little bit of processing of certain proteins it has within it, and there's a viral uh, protein called the protease that's still working on the virus sort of while it's doing its final maturation. And we have now uh, really effective drugs that can inhibit that. So you get sort of these dummy particles floating around that are no longer infectious. So in general, the, the way these drugs are used clinically um, is you get three different drugs targeting at least two different of these targets, right? So you'll get maybe two drugs that, that target reverse transcriptase and it integrates, or two drugs that target this and protease, right? You try to sort of hit the virus um, multiple different ways because all those mutations and all that, that genetic recombination the virus does means eventually it's going to accidentally mutate away out of some of these drugs. But if you target it with multiple drugs and hit it at different points in this infection cycle, that actually gets a lot harder and it makes it really hard for the virus to escape. When ART was first developed, it used to only be used when people started to get sick. So once their CD4 cells declined to a point where they were at risk of developing all these toxic infections, then they put them on, then they were put on ART, sort of kind of restored function. But now um, it's generally been recommended that as soon as someone uh, contracts HIV, they should go on ART. And this just is because the less you have, less time you give the virus to do anything, the more the, the more able you are to preserve the individual's immune system, and they're just going to have a better outcome. Again, the key is that once an individual, an individual is on ART, they have to stay on for life. And, and if they do a bad job of taking the drug and it started, you know, you miss a couple days or a week and the virus comes back up or you're not taking the full dose, this is the exact type of conditions that the virus is looking for for breakthrough, right? Those mutations that are, that might be allowed to happen, um, you know, to, to escape um, will develop in those situations. So they really have to be maintained for life. Uh, and again, current standard is Three drug regimen, which used to be really difficult. Um, and you know, there's stories from people in the early 90s where they were taking you know handfuls of pills three times a day. But formulation science, drug development, all has gotten better. And now a lot of these drugs are combined with a single pill. So there's a, a whole group of single pills that are already formulated to, to contain the three different classes of drugs. So that people living with HIV now, basically in developing countries. Uh, will take one pill once a day, and that will effectively suppress their, their, their virus. Recently, it's gotten even better, so um, I think uh, there's been a, an approval for at least one um, injectable drug, and the nice thing about these injectable drugs is it's one shot, and then the virus is controlled for a month. So this, these long-acting therapies, I think, are going to be a good thing. Um, they make it a lot easier for people to maintain, to adhere to their drug regimen, and it just gives consistent viral control. Why this is important is because not only does the drug keep you healthy um, and allow you not to die from AIDS, right, that's a really important thing, but the drugs are also really good at preventing other people from getting sick. So there was a study in 2011 um, where what they found was, you'll see this sometimes in certain community settings, undetectable equals untransmissible. And, and that's because what was shown in this study is that individuals who are on effective viral suppression of ART and who no longer can detect viral you know, copies in their blood, they don't transmit virus to, to partners, right? So really the, the idea is if the virus is controlled and the copies are very, very low, 
this is going to slow transmission. This is going to make a global impact, right? If everyone was on suppressed, had their viral agreement suppressed, there's really nowhere for HIV to go anymore. It can't be transmitted. It actually probably requires a relatively um, high, um, what we call challenge, so number of viruses that the person is exposed, exposed to to get someone infected. And with AR, with, with effective ARTs, there's just not enough virus that people are exposed to. So that was a, a really pivotal thing, and that's why now when someone diagnosed with HIV, they immediately go on, on, on ART, one, to protect them and maintain their immune system better, but also to protect anyone else around because this makes them really untransmittable. Uh, the other concept with these drugs, so these, these drugs work really well. The, the other way they work is if an individual does not have HIV, but is maybe um, in a situation of high risk, right, maybe has a partner who's HIV positive or is a drug user, um, if they take the drug, what we call pre-exposure prophylaxis, take it before you have HIV, it's really, really effective at preventing someone from acquiring HIV. So, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that, that people who, um, you know, are at risk of being exposed to HIV can do uh, to protect themselves from HIV. So they could take it um, daily, uh, you know, and this is like the same thing like you would take if you were being treated for HIV, a daily pill, and it's really, really unlikely that, that they will be infected with HIV. Now, again, you can't put the entire world on daily prep to stop HIV, but for people that are maybe in high-risk environments, this is a really important strategy. Um, the other way it can work is post-exposure. So, so if someone, you know, went to a, you know, had a high-risk event, maybe um, had a sexual encounter with a partner that they found out the next day was HIV positive, but they didn't know at the time, they could still go to the pharmacy, get these drugs, take it within, I think it's 48 or 72 hours of the exposure, and it's still quite effective, somewhere around 80% effective. So these drugs are actually really useful and are making a huge difference in, in slowing transmission. It's just a thing that, it's really hard to implement on a global scale to really kind of get where we need to be. The other problem is the drugs are wonderful at controlling virus, but they do not get rid of it. They prevent, they're really good at preventing virus replication, they can prevent transmission, but they don't eradicate HIV. So these individuals that have HIV, the HIV is still there in our DNA or expressed at really low levels, especially in sort of these tissue reservoirs, so all the, the parts of our body that we think of as having a lot of lymphocytes. Um, this is one of the big problems for why we cannot really get rid of HIV. Uh, the virus is there, it's hiding. If you remove the ART, it will come back. Um, and, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of work now is being done to try to figure out, well, we can control replication, that's great, but can we actually get rid of the virus that's hiding in people? Because it's, these reservoirs are, are, are a problem. You've probably heard that there have been some people cured of HIV. Um, the first one was Timothy Ray Brown, who was usually called in the South Africa patient. There's been now five or maybe even seven people that, that, as far as we know, are fully cured of HIV. So it's theoretically possible. But in all these cases, these are people that had other diseases. So Timothy Ray Brown had, had leukemia. And to be treated for that leukemia, his entire immune system had to be inflated with radiation and sort of depletion regimens to basically get rid of every immune cell in his body. And then he was then given a stem cell transplant to replace and rebuild a new immune system. And they, he had HIV, and they decided to get stem cells from an individual that has this mutation where they don't express the co receptor. And we've known about this mutation for a while. Um, and and when, so then when his immune system was reconstituted, even if there was some HIV left, all the new cells were uninfectable. And, and over years, he's been sampled and very generous to science and, and really put his body, uh, you know, through whatever it took to prove that that cure was possible. And, and it was, and, and he did, um, he was cured of HIV. And, and actually, I think he, he later did die of, of a recurrence of cancer, not of anything that could be. Um, but so it can happen, but, you know, we're not going to be, this is not a practical thing, right, to, to really obliterate some of the immune system and replace it from cells. But this is sort of giving a, a concept that there might be a possible way to do this. And, and in, in basic science circles, what, what we're doing now is trying to figure out ways, well, if it's hiding in DNA and it's not doing anything, we can't do anything about it, right? A cell that has this virus uh, in its DNA but not expressing viral genes, 
farming system can't find it. So what groups are doing, and there's a large group at UNC that's actually working on this, is trying to figure out ways to sort of wake that virus up. So they were getting in different types of chemicals that make the virus start expressing viral proteins. And once it's expressing itself, now it's no longer a visible immune system. And we can help the immune system maybe by giving it a vaccine or antibodies or something that help it kill these virus cells. So this, this cure strategy that, that people are working on is, used to be called shock and kill, now we're calling it, or by the name change, uncover and eliminate. But the idea is to get that virus out of these latent reservoirs, let our immune system get rid of it. It is probably unrealistic to think that we'll ever get rid of all of the virus in someone that has, has a big virus reservoir. But there's this concept that, that we're trying for, which is called functional cure. So what functional cure is, if you had somebody that was on antiretroviral therapy, they basically have no viral load. If you stop, stop taking drugs, there'll be a period of time that the virus starts ramping up replication again, and then it looks just like a normal infection where it goes really high, then our immune system sort of gets, gets um, control of it again, and, and then the viral, you know, low levels of propagation are maintained. This time to rebound is normally around 7 to 10 days in most individuals. Functional cure might look like many things. One might be if we can do some type of intervention, right, make the reservoir smaller, or give a vaccine or some antibodies while someone's on antiretroviral therapy, take the drug away, do you have a longer time now until the virus comes back? If that time is two or three weeks, it's probably not worth it. But what if it's years, right? What if someone can go off a drug for four or five years, right? Then that might be, uh, might make sense, right? It gives their, you know, their body time to, to uh, not have a drug for, for that long. The other way it might look is, um, is you might get a normal time to rebound, but maybe the virus never comes back to a really high level because our immune system controls it. And if our immune system can control it to a really low level, then you don't have to worry about progressing to immunodeficiency and all of those things. Or ideally, maybe you get a bolt, right? Maybe you get a long period of time where you, the virus doesn't, virus doesn't rebound at all. Um, and then it, when it does come back, it's going to be at a very low level where maybe we, the individual can, you know, not need drugs to maintain their own health. So these are functional cure approaches that are, that are actively being explored right now. Um, and there's just like a minute here left. Viruses are bad, right? Generally, they make people sick, right? HIV obviously is terrible. It's, you know, killing hundreds of thousands of people a year. There are some useful things about viruses, and I told you before, like, one of the things we do when we try to make proteins in the lab is we steal virus promoters, right? We, we've learned how to use those. They're good. Um, retroviruses themselves are actually really important for gene therapy tools. So because a retrovirus has this unique ability to go into our DNA, we can use it to put genes that we want to put into DNA, into DNA, right? Um, so we use this in the lab all the time. If we want to make a cell line in the lab that's expressing a certain protein, well, you build that in a retrovirus, you put the gene in a retrovirus, you infect your cell with a retrovirus, then that gene gets put into the, the DNA of the cell, and you have a cell line that will stably express it. And if you make a copy of that cell, it has that gene in it because it's part of the chromosome. So it's actually a really useful tool in, in uh, basic science, uh, but it's also a really important tool in, in one of the approaches that's being used to, to combat cancer, which is, I've heard these before, CAR T cells. What CAR T cells are is if an individual has cancer, you collect some T cells, and you use a retrovirus, and in that retrovirus, you put the gene that encodes for a T cell receptor that is specific to that person's cancer. What that allows you to do, then that gene, the retrovirus, puts into the cell DNA, you make a lot of copies of the cell, what you end up with is making a lot of copies in the lab of a T cell that's specific for the cancer that the person has. You really grow those up, expand them, you put them back to the person, and those cells go in, find the cancer, and kill it. There's actually licensed therapies that are using, you know, retrovirus transduced T cells to cure cancer. So uh, just a little bit about, you know, there's always a little bit of silver lining, I guess, in some of these things, and, and you know, trying to use um, some of the evolution and creative tricks that viruses have used to sort of work good. So, um, yes. Hello. So what kind of retrovirus do you use to do it? Or do you just make up a... Yeah, so... so you can actually use HIV, you can right. use any retrovirus, and they sort of, what we do in the lab is we engineer them in a way that they're no longer dangerous. So we remove certain right? they, they can no longer, um, that they will lack the genes that make the viral proteins, right? So it's really just, it has the bits that you need to make a copy of your RNA, turn it into adult strand DNA, um, integrate it, but there's nothing else, right? It can't then express as a virus. Yes. Okay, so same 
Satan do that by Satan. The priest was making it dangerous outside, like probably after like extracting it. Why can't we do that in human? Like probably trying to extract what is dangerous then. Yeah, so so in an infected individual, it's in like millions of cells, right? And you have to get rid of every single bad piece. Otherwise, whatever you leave, that virus will turn on replicating your cells, right? So it's, it's very difficult. Um, that's not to say, right, scientists are scared of difficult problems that people aren't trying. One of the things that they're trying is, um, is developing ways to, to sort of express uh, what we call like silencing RNAs. In the cell, so we know the types of things that the, the virus uses to turn on genes, and we can make little pieces of, of RNA that block that. But the hard part is getting that into enough cells to actually prevent the virus from reactivating. And people are working on that. But it's, it's a difficult strategy. CRISPR too. So you know, gene editing, you can you can design a CRISPR system to go in and, and make a cut and, and ruin something that HIV absolutely needs to make copies of itself. People are working on that, but again. To get it in every cell that has HIV, or you didn't hear anything, right? Um, so yeah, it just runs really, you know, complicated life cycle. The unique part is the reverse transcription integration. That integration is key to it to its pathogenesis, and that's because in those early retroviruses examples we talked about, you know, it could grab oncogenes, it could cause cancer. If you go into spots in your DNA that that then cause mutagenesis and cause cancer, it's also how the virus hides from your immune system. Um, we didn't talk about this, but actually retroviruses can do this really well. They can get into DNA, and sometimes if they get into part of DNA that's pretty quiet and isn't really ever expressed, that just gets copied along with the cell, and eventually it just becomes part of our DNA. So actually, if you look in and in, in do a sequencing of people, we have genes that make things, and then we have a bunch of DNA that actually didn't come from us. It just came from retroviruses. It's just stuck there. Some of it doesn't do anything. Some of it's not expressed, but yes. So <clears throat> you said something about some of the uh, cure approaches. Yeah. So you mentioned you don't cover the you know, you're trying to treat. Yeah. Uh, you're trying to treat the virus to come out because. So I'm just curious that in the process of treating the virus, does whatever uh, vaccine or diabetes, does it have any effect on the immune system of the body? Yeah. So one of the problems is. Uh, when you're trying to reactivate the virus, you have to express. You have to use some type of drug or you know approach like that, right? And, and one of the problems is we don't really yet have a really good way to just turn on the virus. We're actually turning on cells to do things that maybe they weren't ready to do. So there are what we call alternate effects, and that's a big area of concern, right? You you that's one of the hard things about drug development, right? Drugs we try to make drugs that are specific to do a thing. But there's often we call side effects and managing those and determining what is the right level of risk. That's, that's always a hard part. Um, but again, the, the, their complex life cycle means we have lots of ways we can drug them. We have really good therapies. Um, their whole complexity is one of the reasons we don't have a vaccine. Um, and again, they can be late, and, and this ability to integrate is really actually something that makes them useful as tools. Yes? Just a question about HIV vaccine. Yeah. Do we think the main target here is to increase the antibody expression, or do we want to target the specific genes, like whole genes? Yeah, so most of the vaccines in the world that we get uh, to prevent infectious disease, like the idea is to make antibodies, right? Antibodies you know, generally bind to the virus, prevent from reacting to themselves, right? We, we think a lot of vaccines primarily work by antibodies. But in reality, most vaccines also are, are activating other parts of our immune system, including T cells, right? So, um, you know, T cells are important because if a virus gets past antibodies and affects the cell, well, they need a T cell to come and kill that cell before it makes more copies. Um, so, in the HIV world, initially, everyone thought it would be really easy to make an antibody vaccine. So, in the first, like, say, 15 years of HIV vaccine engineering, everyone was trying to make antibodies. And then that was actually proved to be really difficult because uh, all that diversity um, means those targets for antibodies are really, really different. So the targets for T cells, because they're things that the virus needs like to work, they're a little bit less different. So people say, wow, we got to make T cell vaccines. So that's going to be easier if we spent two years making T cell vaccines. And then that didn't work either. So now we're back to antibodies with T cells. Right? So we're trying to make them, but at the same time. But yeah. Yes, yeah, I'm going to have a dumb question. But you, the CAR T thing that 
does cancer? Yeah. Right. Can you make a T cell that fights HIV? Yeah, you can. It's not gonna work. Like so like makes the HIV. So right? we have a lot of things. I mean we could and and people have. Um, but the HIV when it's latent, it's just sitting there. There's nothing for the T cell to see. So we need to then combine with those strategies that wake up HIV, but we're actually not too good at that yet. So, you know, that's one of the problems. Yes. So why don't we double down on uh, fighting the, the steps before they're integrated? Part? Like when, when they put the DNA, uh, RNA into DNA, why don't we just stop steps before that? To stop the yeah. So we have really good drugs that could do that, but there's no way to do that there with a vaccine, right? A vaccine isn't really able to do. We can't really... That just biologically isn't how a vaccine would work. The drugs are really good at that, and that's you know one of the reasons why they're so effective. Yes. Um, you talked about the effectiveness of the ARP, mm -hmm. uh, and then when you show the graph showing uh, the the death rate, like how the the current situation we are in, we can see still that we have a larger number of people dying. So I want to know that is it like there's a time frame? when a person gets the viral that makes the effectiveness of the ARP work, or is it that people are not taking it? Yeah, I mean, really, um, um, if you're on the right combination of drugs, ARP works. People are dying for a couple of reasons. One, uh, they're either not on ARP, right? Or uh, it is possible, we, we have a lot of drugs, but we don't have unlimited drugs. So if someone was on a couple drugs and then came off and went back on, but the virus has escaped those, we've got to put a new drug combination in. And if someone, you know, had 40 years of drug therapy but was poorly adherent to all different combinations, it is possible that you no longer could be suppressed. And, and that does still happen. But most of the problem uh, is either, you know, people choosing not to be on drugs, not having access to drugs, or for whatever reason, just not being effectively on the, the therapies. Yes. Um, since HIV is like when you use an antiviral um, drug, it makes the person undetectable, and that an undetectable means like untransmittable as well. Does that mean that if someone like is infected with HIV and the person is not taking antiviral drug, does that mean that the person might not infect anyone because the person doesn't know that it's he or she is positive of HIV yet, and is not showing. Not showing symptoms yeah, doesn't mean you're not going to infect someone because it's just like you know the same thing we learned during COVID, right? Some people would walk around fine and had no symptoms, but when you know didn't know spot, they had like a million copies of, of, of SARS-CoV-2, right? HIV, uh, you know, people that have HIV and have high viral loads could feel totally fine, right? It's a it's a slowly progressive disease. There's no daily symptom after that sort of initial, you know, flu-like symptoms that maybe a couple days. So um, they are probably not undetectable. They probably have a lot of viral load and then therefore are at risk. And that's exactly how we got the pandemic that we have, right? You, It's one of those tricky viruses where you don't know you have it, right? If, if you were sick and bedridden, right, and you couldn't get out of bed, you're probably not going to spread you know, a disease through sexual intercourse, right? But HIV, you're walking around feeling normal, and that's sort of the problem. All right, well, thank you all.